Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. 2,123 children were murdered in 1996. John Bunny Ramsey was one of the last. Hers was the most publicized homicide of the year, one of the most watched investigations of all time. Every piece of evidence is on the Internet. In six books and countless talk shows, every possible scenario has been examined. But what went wrong in the investigation into the murder of the little girl who lived in this house? In a small book, written by a close friend of the Ramseys, there's a dedication to John Bonet by the mother of two of her friends. It begins, We miss your silly smile and grass-stained knees, your flag dance routines, the way you love fireworks, playing on the swing set, picking blueberries by the driveway. This is the image of John Bonet all those closely involved with the case have had throughout the three and a half year investigation into her murder. They see not a child beauty queen, but a six year old little girl. The fact that they've been unable to solve her murder has been a frustrating experience for all of them. John Bonet's parents, the Boulder police, and the DA. You get one cop throwing his badge down because he doesn't think you're being tough enough on the Ramseys, and you have another detective throwing his badge down because he thinks you're too tough. I don't think it was personal. I think, I think it was just that they decided that the parents had done it, and then the longer they stayed on that course, the harder it was for them to back up and say, gee, maybe we should look somewhere else. You know? Ironically, they have all contributed in some way to what went wrong in the investigation. When we looked at the Ramsey case, we found a series of conflicts and missteps that still have not been resolved. It all started with the police and what they did after they walked through the door to the Ramsey house on December 26th, 1996. The 911 call comes in at 5.52 a.m. A child has been kidnapped. 911, what's your emergency? What will become one of the most notorious ransom notes of all time has been found on steps inside the house. The first question has always been, is the FBI, with its expertise in kidnapping cases, called in? We were told the FBI was on its way and it would be a couple hours. Um, and of course, they never came. The Boulder police would only talk to us off camera. But retired FBI agent Ron Walker says the FBI is called in. He gets the call at 9.30 a.m. and immediately sets things in motion, sending agents to the police station to set up a command center, putting traps and traces on the Ramsey phones. When Walker, a former FBI profiler, looks at the ransom note, he makes a prediction. Just the content of the note, uh, the length of the note, uh, some of the specific references in the note itself caused me to, to form an opinion that uh, kidnapping was probably not the underlying motive in this particular crime. My belief was that the child would ultimately be recovered uh, as a homicide victim. Back at the house, Boulder officers do a search. There's a problem with a door to one of the basement rooms. They try the knob, but it's stuck. So they leave without ever seeing what's behind it. On the other side, not five feet away from them, is John Bonet's body. Upstairs, the house is filling up with the Ramsey's friends. Friends who can contaminate a crime scene. By 2 p.m. when Walker arrives at the house, John Ramsey has found John Bonet's body. 
It doesn't make sense. It's as if two crimes have collided inside the house, a kidnapping and a murder. Why would someone kidnap a little girl, leave a ransom note, and then kill her, and leave her body in the house before the kidnapping could take place? The FBI has never seen anything like it. Kidnappers leave ransom notes. I, I can't fathom, fathom a reason of why an individual like that would leave a ransom note, unless the intent ultimately was also to remove the victim from the location and demand a ransom for that person. But that is not something that, uh, in my experience, uh, is, uh, is very prevalent. In fact, I've never seen that. The Ramses say a sexual predator killed their daughter. Why would a sexual predator kidnap a little girl for ransom? This is a deranged person. This is not a person that thinks logically or normally. Uh, when people say, well, yeah, but that, that isn't logical. Nothing is logical in this tragedy. In many ways, this was the perfect murder. Whether it started out that way or was complicated by the investigation. Solving a case, you need physical evidence, crime scene, witness statement, and of course, a little bit of luck. Unless you have the four elements, the case doesn't matter how hard you're working on. You don't see the result. There were no witnesses. There was no experienced crime scene analyst at the scene, and almost four years after the crime, no luck in finding the killer. And so far the evidence, though there are more than 1,200 pieces tested, hasn't been strong enough to point the finger at anyone. It all comes down to two schools of thought. The Ramses did it, and the evidence can't be linked to them because they live in the house, and their hair, fibers from their clothes, their DNA, their fingerprints are everywhere. Or it was an intruder. But without a forensic expert to help them collect evidence at the scene, the Boulder police contaminated or missed what that intruder left. Were you called to the Ramsey house? Uh, no, we were not called to the Ramsey house in the initial stages, no. Can you render a judgment in the John Bonet case on how the evidence was collected? I'd, I'd rather not go there. Um, I can tell you that uh, you know, the, uh, the people that were there collecting the evidence did, did a good job, you know, from our standpoint, but as far as any specifics. There's no doubt there are mistakes made in the first 24 hours of the investigation. Even Boulder's chief of police at the time, Tom Kobe, admits it. It is accurate to say that if we had it to do all over again, we would do it differently. It is also accurate to say that we responded well to what we thought we were confronted with. But the key to where the investigation goes wrong is unquestionably what happens once the kidnapping turns out to be a homicide. And by law, the FBI is no longer in charge. For the first time, Ron Walker explains what happened. I offered at that point uh, any and all FBI resources that were available uh, to assist the Boulder Police in their investigation. And uh, that offer uh, was declined. You know, probably in retrospect, uh, he, he might now say, gee, I wish I would have had 50 agents come up here and immediately do neighborhood canvases, for example. It's a gutsy move for the Boulder Police, with its lean track record of 16 homicides in 10 years. Although the Boulder police called the FBI back into the case the next day, fatal mistakes are made during those first crucial 24 hours. Neighbors aren't questioned, searches aren't done, and the key witnesses aren't in. Although the Boulder police called the FBI back into the case the next day, fatal mistakes are made during those first crucial 24 hours. Neighbors aren't questioned, searches aren't done, and the key witnesses aren't interviewed. Was the family interviewed after the body was found? Uh, were we interviewing John and Patsy? No, we wouldn't. We weren't. That would have been totally uh, unreasonable at that point in time. Okay. 
Walker disagrees. He says the parents should have been interviewed. The parents uh, or the, the folks that are going to be interviewed have to be made to understood that, that although this is a very traumatic event for them to have been involved, uh, you know, they have to try to put a little bit of that aside and sit down, if, if just briefly, and try to recount the events as they recall them to the investigator. We've been told that, that what should have happened that morning is instead of being told just to leave the house and hang around for a few days, we should have been taken immediately to the police department, interviewed separately. That would have protected us and our rights as much as anything. That wasn't done. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty standard procedure, we're told. They didn't ask for our clothing until a year later. over a year later. We had to ask for the pictures. We of couldn't even the, remember what we had wore. We had on. Some experts who call to offer help and are refused say the real problem is that the people in charge are old school cops fighting an old fashioned turf war. There were a couple of very difficult customers to deal with who made decisions early about who done it. And because they were inexperienced, neither one of them ever having worked a homicide case, and because they were in charge, basically, it was a rough period of time. As if that isn't enough to make this case complicated, there's one more unexpected element. The parents aren't about to just sit by and do whatever the police tell them to do. The war between the Ramses and the police starts two days after John Bonet's body is found. And soon the DA's office will get involved. From then on, the investigation will revolve around that awkward triangle. No one has ever seen anything like it. December 28th, 1996. The investigation into John Bonet Ramsey's death is only two days old, and it's already in trouble. The Ramseys hold a memorial service for John Bonet at their Boulder Church. I was just near to death as I think I could possibly be and still be alive. You, you can't function. I mean, I, you know, people said, well, if it had been me, I'd have been, you know, doing this and that. So, well, maybe you're a better man than I was, but I couldn't. I was, I was crushed in the full sense of that word. They tell police they want to take her back to Atlanta, their hometown, for burial what we wanted to deal with immediately after her death was to lay her to rest. We came back to Boulder uh, a few days after that with the sole purpose of sitting down with the police and helping them any way we could. But what they hear makes them change their minds. Their friends tell them the police are threatening the unthinkable to hold John Bonet's body until the couple agrees to interviews. Our friends and attorneys sat us down and said, listen, you need to know what you're dealing with here. They are trying to convict you. And they related the story about how they had uh, ransomed her body the week before, withheld her body for burial. In a letter to us, Boulder County Coroner John Meyer confirmed that the police had considered holding John Bonet's body. For an extremely religious family like the Ramseys, it is unforgivable. To think that uh, uh, they would withhold her body for proper burial was, was, uh, was, was barbaric, absolutely barbaric, not to mention cruel. As I say, it was a deep blow that, uh, that really widened the chasm of trust. This becomes the moment when the investigation splits into warring factions. The Ramses go on the offensive, hiring arguably the best attorneys in Denver. Then, while the police continue to wait for their interviews, the Ramses do one with CNN. There's no question the police are focused on the Ramses from the beginning of the case. FBI statistics pointed them in that direction. I'm not familiar with anywhere uh, a young child was killed in the home and the, uh, the suspect ultimately did not turn out to be a family member. 
It might not have been a parent, but it could have been a brother or a sister or an uncle or, or some other family member. What I've learned, both in our experience and looking at similar situations, is 100% of the time the police always focus on the parents. We understand you got to look at us. We're the parents. We're in the house. But for goodness sake, don't stop there. But they did. Why shouldn't they hire attorneys? Every day in newspaper headlines across America, there are stories about innocent people on death row. Once the police lock in on you, whether you're guilty or innocent, you could be in big trouble. And I think you and I as lawyers would, would advise our clients, or, or would advise a friend in this situation, get a lawyer. I think we would. I mean, I know I would. This is when D.A. Alex Hunter enters the picture. He comes to the case with 25 years' experience, ready to do what the police have not. He calls in experts like Barry Sheck and Dr. Henry Lee from the O.J. Simpson trial and puts together a task force of D.A.s that include Dave Thomas of Jefferson County, who will go through his own well-publicized tragedy in Littleton, Colorado. I think it was at a point in time when he was starting to get truly drained emotionally and wanted to make sure that his objectivity was in place. Make sure I'm doing the right thing. Let's talk about this. and if, Maybe you can think about uh, things that I haven't thought about. When you have one of those really tough, gut-wrenching cases, I think it is helpful. What Hunter doesn't see coming is John Ramsey's lawyers, Haddon, Morgan, and Foreman. The National Law Journal lists Haddon as one of the nation's top white-collar crime attorneys. Haddon's firm pulls out the stops on the Ramsey case. Within days, the Ramseys put together a team that includes a media relation consultant and their own private investigators. They take out ads, offering rewards. Publish sections of the ransom note in the local newspaper, asking if anyone recognized the handwriting. They start their own website and hotline. We had a lot of investigative work going on right from the beginning when we realized that uh, the police just weren't cutting it. Depending on your point of view, the Ramseys are either trying to generate leads the police aren't, or they are diverting attention from themselves. How much did Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, either uh, consciously or unconsciously, or through their handlers, um, attempt to control this investigation and perhaps attempt to move the investigation away from them? I think that's something that no one will really ever know over time. And then the final straw. The Ramsey's attorneys lay out conditions for how their clients will be interviewed. The interviews won't last more than two hours and will take place at Haddon's offices. The Ramsey's will be interviewed together and Patsy's doctor, as well as their counsel and private investigators, will be present. The police response is an emphatic no. January passes, February, March, and still no interviews. Well, it puts the investigators at a disadvantage because simply they don't have the information from the parties that are really most crucial to the reporting of the event. In April, Alex Hunter steps in. When we got to around April, and this case was stalled, the decision was made, we need to interview these people. The police accuse Hunter of doing some unconventional, if not questionable, things to get the interviews, which appeared to some to be favoring the Ramseys. Did you give the Ramsey attorneys evidence um, to get the April interviews? No evidence in this case was given to the Ramseys that was not the product 
of a joint decision between Kobe, Commander Eller, and my people. The Ramsey attorneys say they want to see their client's statements from December 26th. It was a prerequisite to that interview. And I felt that was not giving up anything that I felt was significant. But the police do. They believe Hunter is allowing suspects to review their statements for discrepancies. The relationship between the DA and the police begins to crumble. Like everything else in this case, the rift, as it becomes known, goes public. You know, in the 25 years before this case came in, it was a cakewalk. So this has been a real challenge, which I feel grateful to have had the opportunity, believe it or not, to try to meet. Um, it would have been very easy to go some different directions. You know, I mean, I had some people say to me, let's file a case, lose it, then you can write a book and make a couple of million dollars. You know, I mean, that, that's not how I think the American prosecutor operates in this country. And I'm proud, I, I'm proud to be an American prosecutor. By 1997, the three sides of the Ramsey investigation, the police, district attorney, and the Ramsey team were all pulling in different directions. Under the glare of the media's spotlight, the investigation began to buckle. This media person asked me a question. He said, Tom, why are you so mad at us? And I said, I'm not mad at you. He said, don't you understand <clears throat> that we know the Ramseys did it and we're going to help you get them? Things happen during the case that are often too strange to be believed. I said, so you hear what you just said? How wrong is that? How scary is that? How in violation of everything that you're supposed to believe in is that? The police and the DA are granting hundreds of media interviews to just about any reporters who ask. Just so I bring it up, you know, I, I spent some, a good deal of time with Globe reporters. I'd never read a tabloid before this case. But, you know, your viewers need to understand the Globe had a million dollar reward in this case. They were getting leads that the cops weren't getting and that I wasn't getting. The Ramses and the police seemed to be waiting each other out. You said that you waited and waited and never had any word from the police about what was happening. Ninety days passed without any word. Why didn't you call them? We did. A couple of times I called in, in the summer of 97. I mean, I just, we were hearing nothing. Wouldn't you think that the parents should be updated every once in a while as to what's happening on their child's murder investigation? It has become a case study in a homicide investigation gone wrong. There are now three investigations going on. One by the police, the DA, and the Ramses. And none of the people involved are talking to each other. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the most complicated case I've seen. It, it, it certainly is complicated because uh, uh, you know, of all of the, the, the different players that you had in this thing that sometimes uh, appeared to be at odds with one another when the common goal should have been uh, just to investigate the case properly and, as I said, uh, uh, make sure that justice is served. It's an extraordinary time that leads to unprecedented actions. One day, the commander, this Commander Eller, came to me and he said, we think you've broken into our computer in the war room. I said, oh, really? Who do you think did it? He said, either you did it or your assistant did it. I said, John. He said, Alex, I have CBI coming in. They're going to investigate this. The computers are investigated, but there's no sign of tampering. And then, another blow. They said to me one day, we're bringing in our own lawyers. I don't think that ever had been done in another case in the United States. And my feelings were hurt for about three minutes. Equally insulting to the police, Hunter brings in his own investigator, 
a seasoned detective named Lou Smith, with a record of more than 200 solved homicides. But the strangest event in this strangest of cases has to be that four months after their daughter's murder, the Ramses still haven't done an interview with the police. Why didn't you give an interview before four months after the crime? Well, we did, first of all. We, we met with the police on the 26th. We met with them on the 27th. Uh, we gave fingerprint, handprint, blood samples, hair samples on the 28th, I think it was. On the one hand, I think there, there were, they were cooperative about certain things that you and I know we, we get by law, blood, hair. But in terms of what they have a right to deny the government, it took us a while to get that. April 30th, 1997. The Ramses finally agree to their first interview with the police. They are both witnesses and suspects in their daughter's murder. Nothing that will break the case comes out of the interviews. They are Detective Tom Trujillo. By December 1997, Steve there's a new Thomas. police commander on the case, Mark Detective Beckner. Jane Harmer. One of the main topics at his first news conference is the police request for a second interview with the Ramses. It's been approximately six months since we last uh, interviewed the Ramses. During that time, there's been a lot of investigation. We've uncovered a lot of new information. We have a lot of new questions, and uh, they can help us answer those questions. Uh, they have indicated every willingness to cooperate and have done so uh, during my nine weeks anyways, and um, so I expect that uh, we'll get that done uh, in the near future. But it won't happen. It will be three years before the Ramses and police talk again. They will do two subsequent interviews with the DA. Their only stipulation, to which the DA agrees, is that the police are not involved. The relationship between the DA and the police will improve with Mark Beckner in charge. I think what, what is unacceptable is that it took us that long to get it back and we lost some ground and we you know that, that's too bad i'm not sure the case was compromised uh, i don't think it was but we lost time but if the da and the police eventually do get back on track there will never be a ceasefire with the ramses the confusion in the john bonnet ramsey case has always been that the evidence is like an illusion Look at it one way, and someone who lived in the house did it. Look at it another, and it was an intruder. The ransom note, written on the Ramsey's own notepad, was either written by someone who lived in the house, or a clever intruder who didn't want to risk being caught going in with a ransom note in his pocket. The DNA found under John Bonet's fingernails and in her underpants either belongs to an intruder or is a mixture of her blood and something else. For example, if you found a blood stain on the walkway, we cannot guarantee 10 minutes before this case somebody spit on the same spot. Subsequently, the blood stain deposited on that area you're going to have a mixture. We really don't know when that DNA was deposited. In August 1998, police investigator Steve Thomas is so sure the Ramses are guilty, he resigns from the force. A month later, Lou Smith, the DA's investigator, is so sure they're innocent, he resigns. The answers that could prove who's wrong and who's right may have been inside at one time and been erased through contamination, or they may never have been there at all. Much has been made of the layout of the Ramsey house. There are four stories, or three floors in a basement. The top floor, where John and Patsy's bedroom was. The next floor, where the children's bedrooms were. 
the main floor, and the basement where John Bonnet's body was found. Some feel it was easy for an intruder to get in and a maze for the police to search. Dave Williams, a Ramsey private investigator, agreed to take me inside to see how an intruder could have gotten in and killed John Bonnet. Few people have been here since her death. If you believe the intruder theory, the killer enters the Ramsey house after the family leaves to visit friends on Christmas Day, 1996. Hiding in the house, he waits until the Ramseys come home. They go to bed early. The children on the second floor, the Ramseys on the third. Now, this is the main stairs, isn't it? That's correct. This would be the main staircase or the front staircase. And we're now coming into the master bedroom, which is on the fourth floor? That's correct. This master suite, um, when it had furniture in it, the bed was towards the front of the house. And uh, then back in here were um, dressers and chairs and sofas. And then beyond is John's um, office, actually. Now, where is John Bonet's bedroom from here? It would be in the back of the house, uh, one flight down. All the way down and then on the floor just below this. The floor just below this. So yes. these are the back stairs. These are the back stairs, that's correct. So we come down the back stairs to a living area and the spiral stairs keep going on down. And where is John Bonet's bedroom? This would be John Bonet's bedroom here. It still seems lived in because law students are staying here for the semester. Now, how far is this bedroom where John Bonet was sleeping from the parents? Well, from their bed, it's approximately 70 feet. 70 feet back, one floor down. One floor down. And there was no one else in this wing. No, that's correct. According to the intruder theory, everyone is asleep. The intruder comes into this room and uses a stun gun on John Bonet. There are reported to be rectangular marks on her body, here and here, that match the prongs on a stun gun. The intruder takes John Bonet down the spiral steps leading from her bedroom. Where was the ransom note found? Uh, either on this stair or the first stair. Now, where would be the likely route onto the basement? Well, it would be one of two ways, either through the kitchen or this way through uh, what we call the butler's pantry. So you have to drop down an additional half story to get to this level of the house. You pass a door. Why couldn't or wouldn't somebody just walk out? This may have never really been a kidnapping. They did not want to go outside. They were making their way to the basement. Once in the basement, the intruder chooses a room. The room where the green table is, is called Burke's train room. The room where John Bonet's body is found, though described as hidden, is straight ahead. Is there a light? Right up against this edge. Now, oh, Dave, where was the body found? It would have been in the center back in the room. Investigator Lou Smith says there's evidence of an intruder, including a pubic hair found in this room on John Bonet's blanket, DNA on her body, a footprint, and handprint. There is the mold that we hear about where I believe a footprint was found. And where was the palm print found? The palm print, uh, it is our understanding, was found on the interior of this door. The belief is, while it's an easy house to get into, the intruder came through this basement window. This is the window in question, this first one. It's larger than I had thought and lower, actually, to the basement. So when it opens, why, it's quite a large entry and exit. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, what is the strongest piece of evidence in this case? 
Well, as far as the intruder theory goes, it would have to be the evidence in and around this basement window. Evidence, William says, that the grate was moved and barks and twigs cleared from the center window where the intruder entered the house. The popular theory in law enforcement circles is that Patsy Ramsey, angry over John Bonet's chronic bedwetting, hits her and, thinking she's dead, stages a kidnapping to cover it up. The problem with the Ramseys as suspects is that they don't seem to fit the profile of parents who killed their children. I think she would have typically been a low-risk victim by uh, all the information that I have available. Uh, there was nothing in that home that would have indicated to me that uh, she was at high risk for violent victimization. At the core, I don't believe that, that either one of these people are the ogerts or the evil or bad people that the, that the media has made them out to be. Uh, having said that, uh, good people can do bad things, and bad things can happen to good people. The big question is, could parents with no history of abuse use something like this on their own daughter? This is the garage uh, tied around, apparently, a paintbrush handle. Here you have a kind of a noose created at one end, a handle to pull it back and this is a close-up of that knot. That knot looks pretty significant. I don't think I could have tied that knot. This is not the way uh, a parent would kill their child. Well, as much as it pains me to say this, uh, yes. Um, I've seen parents who have decapitated their children. I've seen cases where parents have drowned their children in bathtubs. I've seen cases where parents have uh, have strangled their children, uh, have placed them in paper bags and smothered them, have strapped them in the car seats and driven the car into a body of water. Um, any way that you can think of that a person can kill another person, um, almost all those ways are also ways that parents can kill their children. Are there other suspects out there that should be questioned? There are other suspects. Once you believe that there's a possibility that someone entered this home, then there's a whole world of suspects as opposed to just the people in this house. In the end, all the key players will have to take some responsibility for what happens to this investigation. If the police, inexperienced in homicide investigations, would have gotten help at the beginning of the case, things might have turned out differently. The Ramses, whether they were suspects or not, could have been more cooperative. You know, we can spend the next three years talking about who should have done what, who did what wrong, who did what right. The point is, there's still a killer loose, Let's admit there were mistakes made. I'll admit we made mistakes. I won't go any further than that. But let's get on with it. Let's put the egos in the drawer. Let's go back and let's start over and let's find this creature before he kills again. Some of the blame has to go to the Ramsey's lawyers. Or maybe this case is just an example of the way our justice system is headed. D.A. Hunter's contribution to all of this is still to be determined. A question has been raised that could put yet another twist on how he will be remembered in this case. Did the grand jury really vote to indict the Ramses, and did Alex Hunter decide against it because he felt he didn't have the evidence? No charges have been filed. He told us he could not comment on what the grand jury did, but he did say... I mean, I can point to cases, and, and you have talked about cases, 
Um, where the prosecutor is pushed to move, I frankly think the prosecution in OJ was pushed to move by the Cochrane group too quickly. I think they fell for it. It was lost. It's over. And I don't think that's what this little girl wants me to do. When I try to look through her eyes, that is not what she wants me to do. And I am not going to... Um, uh, give in to the crowd, if you will. I'm just not going to do that. And the media will have to take its share of the blame. <laughs> is it our team against their team and you've got a better team? Well, what I've learned is that there's uh, no end to the vulgarity of journalism. Have you got a team to go against the Ramseys? I think uh, journalists report the news that people uh, want to, to see and hear. But a great disappointment is that the fact that uh, in, in view of all of the media attention paid and all the voyeuristic attention on the part of the public paid to it, uh, in there is lost the, the real idea that a little girl was killed and uh, uh, the investigation was impacted really. Uh, to some extent by, by all of this undue attention paid to it. We believe that America has lost the concept of presumption of innocence. Uh, we've been tasked with proving that we're innocent, and that shouldn't be. The Ramseys are scheduled to meet with the Boulder police for the first time in three years in August 2000. Chief Beckner has made some changes in the Boulder Police Department. He's added a crime scene processing unit, and police officers now carry a check sheet on what to do when a child is reported missing. The Ramseys have not been inside their Boulder home since John Bonet's body was found. The house is on the market. In the blink of an eye, someone came into our home not only killed our child, but killed everything that we had built and worked hard for to prepare for the future. It took a lot of people down with it. What have you learned from the case? There is a dynamic that develops. You know, when you have a camera at your face and a microphone, you know, somewhere else, you produce a soup that I think causes people to act in strange and bizarre ways. Uh, if, if help and assistance is offered, take it. <laughs> you can always put it in the closet or you can always send them away. You know, I think all of us who are committed to this case hope that the person or people who perpetrated this offense you know, some people find this cruel, but I hope it does eat at them because I want people to come forward and say, I'm responsible and, and, you know, I need to be accountable for what I did because the murder of a little girl should haunt people. Four people resign from the Boulder Police Department as a result of the Ramsey case, including the chief and the commander of detectives. After 27 years as district attorney, Alex Hunter is leaving office in January. The Ramseys have been forced into a more private lifestyle than they would have wished for their son. Such mayhem could almost be expected since the killer is still free. In the end, the strongest contribution to history made by this case could be that it stands for a new principle of law. In court, the presumption of innocence prevails. But in the court of public opinion, the presumption of guilt is stronger.